please welcome Laverne Cox. I sit down. Oh my goodness. Oh, you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> Creating Change 2014, how are you feeling tonight? I, I, I don't know if I believe you. Creating Change 2014, how are you feeling tonight? Oh, Jesus, I love you back. I love you back, baby. Yes, I do. Oh my God, Mwah. I love you. I I'd like to thank Kate Clinton for that lovely introduction. Make some noise for Kate Clinton. And I'd like to thank everybody at the task force who made me being here possible tonight. Special shout out to Daniel Pino, Mark Daly, Ray Carey and recent hire at the task force, brother Kyler Broadus. Where is Kyler? Is Kyler in the house somewhere? We love you, Kyler Broadus. Yes. Yes, we do. Oh my God, this feels so amazing. All, all this love that, that, that you're giving me tonight. I have, I have to say that, that a black transgender woman from a working class background raised by a single mother. That's me. Getting all this love tonight. This feels like the change I need to see more of in this country. <laughs> Cornell West reminds us, and you've heard me say this a zillion times, that justice is what love looks like in public. And this feels so just right now, yes. But, but, but I have to tell you, I have to tell you that I am not used to receiving this, this kind of love, everybody. I'm not used to it. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying, you know, some days, <laughs> some days I wake up and I'm that, three, four, five, 12, 13, 14 year old kid in Mobile, Alabama, who was bullied. Some days I wake up and I'm, I'm that kid who's being chased home from school practically every day by groups of kids who wanted to beat me up because I did not act the way that people assigned male at birth was supposed to act. Some days I wake up and I'm that sixth grader who swallowed a bottle of pills because I did not want to be myself anymore because I did not know how to be anybody else. And who I was, I was told was a sin, was a problem. And I didn't want to exist. Some days I wake up and I am that black, trans woman walking the streets of New York City, hearing people yell, that's a man to me. And I understand, I've come to understand that when a trans woman is called a man, that is an act of violence. Some days I, I, I wake up and I am just a girl who wants to be loved. But I was told on more than one occasion by a man who, who, who told me that he loved me, that he could not be seen in public with me, could not introduce me to friends and family because I am trans. And not only because I am trans, because people can tell that I am trans. I am not passable enough by certain standards. Some days I wake up and I don't feel good enough because I've heard that over and over again. I've heard it from men I've dated. I've heard it 
from members of my own community who told me that I'm not passable enough, that I should not go and get surgery for this and that, and then I will be an acceptable trans woman. Some days I wake up and I have heard about another one of my transgender sisters who has been assaulted, raped, murdered. And there's no justice. Amen. There will be justice. Some days I wake up and it is just too much. It is too much to deal with. It's too, there's too much pain. There's too much cultural trauma around being who I am. But, but then I think. I think we are resilient people. I think about so many people, yes. So many people who've come before me, who've made me being on this stage possible. People like Sylvie Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson. People like Miss Major. People like Monica Roberts, Kyla Broaddus. People like Candace Kane, who in 2007 became the first trans woman to have a recurring role on a primetime TV show. I would not be here without Candace Kane. And in the face of so much injustice, we are a resilient people. We are a fierce people. We are a beautiful people. I, I am so blessed. This, this past year, I've gotten to, to meet so many people in, in, in our community. I, I've traveled the country. And, and, I, and a major event for me happened last year in March in, in, in Chicago. <laughs> Chicago's in the house. Yeah. And it was the first ever Trans 100. The realization of the dream of Tony Dorsey and Jen Richards, who I, I think they're here tonight, y'all. Yeah. How you doing? Love you. And it, and it was so powerful being in the room with, in, in an event created by and for trans people, where we were celebrating each other, doing it for ourselves. It, it was major for me. It, it, it shifted my thinking about who I am and what is possible. And I, and I found out about Chicago House's Trans Life Center. If you don't know about Chicago House's Trans Life Center, you need to find out. They're doing amazing work. Amazing, amazing work. There, there are so many folks doing amazing work all over this country. I got to meet Ruby Corrado last year. She is the founder of Casa Ruby in Washington, D.C. And she does, she does amazing outreach to the trans, and specifically the trans Latina communities. And, and Ruby is doing this work with so few resources but a lot of love and a lot of resilience. Now there's, there, there, there's a lot of people in this, in this room tonight who might have some access to some resources that, 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 that Ruby could use. So, so Ruby's right there, so you need to go in to talk to Ruby. She needs, she needs some money to keep doing this powerful work. The, the, the reality, the reality is that there are a lot of amazing people who are unsung, trans people who are unsung, doing incredible work all over this country. I, um, many of you know that I um, had the pleasure of uh, spending some time with a woman by the name of Cece McDonald recently. As many of you know, Cece is now free.
For those of you who don't know, Cece McDonald is, is a beautiful, vibrant, brilliant African-American transgender woman who on June 5th, 2011, was just walking down the street with a group of her friends, and she heard racist slurs, anti-trans slurs, anti-gay slurs, and a fight broke out. And one of her attackers ended up dead. A white supremacist, by the way, with a swastika tattooed on his chest. And Cece was arrested on the spot, the only person arrested that night. And, and, and Cece um, had a glass slashed in her face. Her salivary gland was severed. And she was bleeding, defending herself because she refused to be a statistic. In this room, we are all familiar with the, the unfortunate statistics of, of, of the homicide rate of trans women in our community. It's the highest. Over 53% of, of LGBTQ homicides in 2012 were trans women. 73% were people of color. But Cece said, I will not go out like that. And I have had the pleasure not only of meeting Cece, but meeting the people who, who, who made, made us aware of Cece's story. Cece had an amazing support team. Um, um, Katie Burgess at, um, at Tyson, the Transgender Youth Support Network in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and, and Billy um, um, Navarro, um, I can't think of Billy's last name. Um, <laughs> thank you, Billy Navarro. Billy's gonna kill me and Billy Navarro and so many others on CC's support staff who, who made sure that CC, while she was incarcerated, was not going to be disappeared. So Billy said something really powerful to me. We're, we're making a documentary about CC McDonald and about the culture of violence against trans women. When, when I spoke to Billy for the first time, Billy said to me, about the, the media coverage of CC at the beginning of her case, that, they were, that the media was upset because Cece had the audacity to survive. And, and, and trans women of color are not supposed to survive. We so often, so often people seem to want, prefer us to be dead. We have our, our transgender day of remembrance where it seems like one of the few times where people seem to speak the names of trans women, it's usually trans women and trans women of color. CC survived, and there are so many survivors out there. But 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 CC survival and 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 her her resilience was made possible because of, because she was brilliant and she was amazing and she led her support team in an, in an amazing way. But it was also possibly because of the work of grassroots activists in Minneapolis, Minnesota. If it were not for those activists, we would n those, the story of Cece McDonald would be what mainstream media wanted to tell us about her. They made sure we knew the real story. We made, they made sure that we knew that Cece was attacked in a, because she was black, because she was trans, because she was a woman, and that she was railroaded by the criminal justice system because of all those things. They're doing amazing work in Minneapolis, Minnesota with very few resources. They can use some resources in Minneapolis, Minnesota too. When, when after I after interviewed Cece for the first time, I, I um, visited her in, when she was still incarcerated in November of last year. And it was really emotional for me. And, but my biggest takeaway from the whole experience is that I said to Jack Garris, um, my director um, for, for the documentary, Cece knows that she is loved. It, 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 was, it was so powerful to me that, that she would have such a positive and upbeat attitude considering everything that she has gone through. 
She was, she was like my character on Orange is the New Black. She was denied the proper dosage of hormones and she advocated for herself. Her supporters on the outside advocated for her and she got the correct dosage. On three different occasions, she was placed in solitary confinement, which is the practice for housing trans people far too often when they're incarcerated. But she advocated for herself and people on the outside advocated for her and got her out of solitary confinement. For me, the, 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 the way in which Cece advocated for herself and the way in which her support committee advocated for her it is a template for how we can do activism all over this country. And it started, it started with Cece and it started with her having this profound sense of love for herself that everyone around her felt. Everybody I talk to who's come in contact with Cece talks about this woman who inspired them and who had so much hope and propelled them to have hope too and to fight on her behalf. Love for a black trans woman freed her and kept her safe on the inside. Loving trans people, I believe, is a revolutionary act. And, and, and I believe when, when we love someone, we, we, we respect them. And, and, and when we listen to them, we, we feel that their voice matters. And, and we let them dictate the terms of who they are and what their story is. Now, now, now um, Kate Clinton mentioned uh, an interview that I, I did on the show, on, on the Katie Couric show. That, <laughs> and for me, that moment was a really amazing example of creating change. And I only want to take partial credit for it. <laughs> I, it, it, was, it was Carmen Carrera saying that, <laughs> Carmen Carrera insisting that there are certain things about her that are private, that, that, that trans bodies are not to be subject to everyone's gaze and, and, and objectification. And I was so happy and honored to be able to have her back on national television. Trans women supporting and loving each other is a revolutionary act. So someone tweeted to me that we, um, my, my dear friend Janet Mock, you, you might know Janet Mock, right? Her book, Redefining Realness, comes out on Tuesday. I hope you've pre-ordered it. It's major. But, but Janet and I were tweeting each other, and, 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 and I, I support her and love her, and, and she's shown similar love and support of me. And, and someone tweeted, hashtag the scarcity model is a myth. That, 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 that we don't need to be fighting each other for resources. There is, there is enough to go around. There is enough spotlight to go around if we love each other and if, and if we remain teachable. I think the, the, the biggest thing about the Katie Couric moment is that she, she did a follow-up on that Friday saying that that moment was a teachable moment for her. And, and Many of us have, have watched, for my entire life, I've watched television and watched folks interview trans people and ask all these invasive questions. I've been asked these questions on television before, but never before have I seen in mainstream media a discussion about what is appropriate and not appropriate to ask trans people. Yeah. 
And that is a change. That is a, ch that is a change that we really, really need. We can set the conversation. Jennifer Finney Boylan um, tweeted to me that, that for the first time, we are setting the agenda for how our stories should be told in mainstream media. Because we've been doing it for a long time, it's just it hasn't gone mainstream. Right? And I want to let you know that it is because of you that the change happened. It wasn't just about Carmen and me, it was about all of the tweets and the blogs that you wrote and the articles that you wrote and the radio shows you went on to talk about it afterwards and the other TV shows that you went on and said, this is not acceptable. And this is not to demonize Katie Kirk. I love Katie Kirk. But Katie Kirk was just following the, 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 the lead of so many journalists and talk show hosts over the years. For the past 60 years since Christine Jorgensen stepped off the plane, the conversation about trans people in mainstream media has centered on transition and surgery. And even when there are humanizing moments, that, that, that I, I, it's my contention that the transition and surgery conversation becomes the big takeaway, becomes a sensational moment. And our humanity is left in the dust. And, 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 and the, so much of the injustice that too many of us experience is not talked about. We are changing the conversation right now. I, I, I'm so happy to be a working actor. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's, it, it's a big deal. And on Orange is New Black, I play an incarcerated trans woman who, who is in prison um, because she stole some credit cards <laughs> to finance her transition. Healthcare for trans people is a necessity. It is not elective, it is not cosmetic, it is life-saving. But we are more than our bodies. We are more than our bodies. The, the, the criminalization of trans people is, is, is so pervasive in, in this culture. C.C. McDonald's case is one example, and I, I'm sure many of you are aware of a 16-year-old girl in California by the name of Jules Gutierrez. 16 years old and, and was bullied like so many transgender youth. 78% of trans youth in grades K through 12 experience harassment and bullying in school. 78%, that is unacceptable. And after being taunted over and over and over again, Jules defended herself. She and the, and the folks who bullied her were all suspended, but the district attorney decided that he would arrest her for assault, for being bullied and defending herself. And she is the only one arrested. This, this pisses me off. There is a system in place which seeks to make trans people, particularly trans people of color, disappear. And part of that is the criminal justice system. I live in New York City now. There's been a lot of conversations about the stop and frisk policy and, and reforming it, but there really hasn't been enough talk about how that policy affects trans people, particularly trans women of color. Trans women are far too often profiled as sex workers and arrested if they have more than one condom in their purse. This is a practice that happens all over the world. 
criminalized simply for wearing a short skirt in the wrong neighborhood. That shit is fucked up. But that is part of a larger culture which assumes that trans people are legit illegitimate, that we are fake, that we are always and only the gender that we were assigned at birth. Arizona tried to criminalize going to the bathroom for transgender people. Amen. Give it up. That was stopped. But these are the fights that we have to wage every day just to, just to have a sense of, of legitimacy. But we're resilient people and we're strong. And there are so many of you creating that change right here, right now, and back in your home cities. I, I'm, I love you back. I really do. You, you really don't know. It's just. <sighs> it's it it really is a big deal to 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 have this kind of support, um, being who I am, and and I and I hope it it can. I I want everybody to get this. I want everybody to get this kind of love. I want to spread it around. I want to spread it around. I. I, I want to close by um, talking about a dear friend of mine, um, Jeremiah Johnson, who's here somewhere. He's, he's a brilliant AIDS activist, and we were, um, I was having a little freak out about my, my talk here tonight, earlier today, and we, w we were sitting in, in my hotel room chatting, and Jeremiah reminded me that he and I have these really difficult conversations across difference. Jeremiah is, is, is HIV positive, and um, he, he, he reminded me that we've had difficult conversations where I didn't exactly know what was the right thing to say to him as an HIV positive person. And he has not always known what the right thing to say to me as a trans woman, but we still have the conversations, and we have them We have those conversations with love and with empathy and, and, and with a desire to get to a level of understanding that we didn't have before. And we wanna support each other and we wanna be there for each other. And I believe these are the kinds of conversations that we need to have more of in our community where we are really there for each other across difference because we're all LGBTQ, queer, you know, we have, but we have all these differences. We have so much that, that we have in common, but we have so many th ways that make us different. And we can have conversations across those difference with differences with love and empathy and vulnerability. And so as we embark on creating change 2014. I want to, to, to send a lot of love to each and every one of you and, and implore you to have conversations over the next few days with love towards one another and, and yourselves. You know, the, the whole, I wanna, I wanna say the whole self-love thing has always been kind of, kind of baffling to me. I've always been like, love myself, well, how the heck am I supposed to do that? And, and, and I believe now I'm starting to understand a little bit of what it means, that, that I don't internalize all the negative things and negative stereotypes that people have about trans women of color. I don't, I don't do that number on myself anymore. I don't. <laughs> I, 
I don't date men anymore who are ashamed to be seen in public with me. I am starting to believe that in the deepest core of myself that I am beautiful, I'm smart, I am amazing. And I want to give that to each and every one of you because you are beautiful, smart, and amazing. Happy Creating Change 2014. I love you all.